Welcome to End of Life University on YouTube. Today I'm sharing with you an audio only recording from the archives of the podcast. And this is an interview I did with Francis Weller about the sacred work of grief and his book, The Wild Edge of Sorrow. A beautiful book, and I think you'll really enjoy this conversation. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel down below if you haven't already. Also subscribe or follow the podcast wherever you happen to listen, leave a rating and review. And if you're so inclined, uh, chip in a, a few dollars a month to keep this show on the air by going to eoluniversity.com slash support, finding out how you can make a difference and keep us going. So thank you in advance for that. And now we'll move on with my interview with Francis Weller. Hello, everyone, and welcome to End of Life University podcast, where we share real talk about life and death. I'm your host, as always, Dr. Karen Wyatt. I'm glad you're here with me today for episode number 223. In a little bit, I'll be sharing with you an interview I did with Francis Weller about his book, The Wild Edge of Sorrow, and we'll be talking all about grief. This is an interview I actually did for a year of reading Danger on online reading group, we read Francis's book for that group. But I wanted to share the interview with you. And in particular, right now at this time of year, because grief is a really important issue that needs to be discussed as we're looking at the holidays and many people are uh, struggling a bit with grief issues. So it's an important topic. And I wanted you to hear this interview. Uh, Francis is amazing. Every word he says is so poetic and beautiful. And I hope that you enjoy listening to it. Um, before we start with that interview, I'd like to thank my latest supporter on my page at patreon.com slash EOLU. Robinette Williams. Thank you, Robinette, for joining our team and stepping up to make a monthly contribution. If any of you listening want to know more about how to become a Patreon supporter, you can go to patreon.com slash EOLU. And thanks again. So we'll get on with the interview with Francis Weller. And stay tuned when the interview's over with. I'll be back with a few takeaways and to say goodbye. So here we go. Francis Weller is the author of the book, The Wild Edge of Sorrow, Rituals of Renewal and the Sacred Work of Grief. And Francis is a psychotherapist, an author, obviously, and a soul activist. He has worked for 35 years as a psychotherapist, practicing what he calls soul-centered psychotherapy. And I think in reading the book, you got a really good idea of what that consists of. And you can read more about Francis, his work, and his other book. And then he has a new book that will be coming out in the future at his website, FrancisWeller.net. So Francis, thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, I'm so glad this all this came together and we were able to have this conversation because your book was very moving to me and I feel like it's it's in so many ways a really appropriate time of the year to be reading a book about grief as we've gone into the winter season and so I don't know for me it's just been very soothing to be reading your chapters and thinking about your book for the last month here um, oh. throughout the holidays. And so I'm, uh, I'm, I'm really grateful. I'm very happy that I made it the December selection because <laughs> that turned out to be perfect. Mm -hmm. I wanted to read a quote from the preface, Francis. Um, you wrote, bringing grief and death out of the shadow is our spiritual responsibility, our sacred duty. And I just, I love that idea and in a way a call to action for all of us that no matter who we are and no matter what change we hope to bring the, into the world, we really must address grief. And I was going to tell you just a little story that I was involved in the past with a group that was very concerned about the environment and wanted to put together uh, an, an event um, expressing their concern and worry about what can we do for the environment. And I had suggested that maybe we should have some sort of a grief ritual as part of this event. And everyone looked at me <laughs> and said, 
we don't have time for that. We're trying to save the planet. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just wanted to to, uh, get your reflections on that because it seems to me that grief is really, from what you've been writing, the way we, the only way we can save the planet in some ways is by honoring that grief. Well, thank you. Yes, I completely agree with that. That, um, you know, what's really given me hope in the past 10 years or so is that it's the broken heart that has the capacity to respond to the sorrows of the world with anything meaningful other than kind of moral obligation. Moral duty will not do it for us. We won't fix the world or respond to the world out of duty, but out of love. And love is generated through the heart. And the way we access the heart is to acknowledge the sorrows and sufferings of the world. And if we do not you know, acknowledge those, we won't come to the, to the place of doing it out of a deep and profound affection. We'll be doing it out of some sense of, like I said, obligation. And that's not going to get us there. And so that's why I said in that, in that passage you just shared that it's our, it's our spiritual responsibility to tend to the issues of sorrow and death. They are all around us every day, whether it's the roadkill on the side of the road, or whether it's hearing about another species' disappearance or you know, the calving of the glaciers or whatever is going on, we are inundated by it. And so our response must include some form of recognition. In a sense, what I'm saying is that we are the organism on the planet whose responsibility is, is to register these losses. If we don't, who will? And if we don't register these losses, we won't be able to find the right responses to the to the larger issues that we're facing. So... Mm. Yeah. So beautiful. And and you wrote as well, I was really touched about the capacity of na- nature itself to help us heal. And this past fall, I was in Southern California when the horrific fires were taking place mm. in California, Northern and Southern California. I could sit on the deck of the condo where we were staying and see the fires burning across the bay yeah. in Malibu and it was just I've just never seen anything like it so close to me and seeing the smoke in the air for days and I carried around with me a really heavy heavy grief over that those fires and a sense of helplessness and um a few weeks later at Thanksgiving time my daughter came to stay with us and she said mom we need to go see where the fires were we need to go see the destruction and she convinced me that we had to go there we had to go drive up into those mountains and drive through any roads that were open and just see the areas where the fire had burned everything out Mm -hmm. and we we did that at one point we were able to park the car and get out and walk across the charred earth completely black and just everything in sight devastated and yet, in that moment, when we, when our feet touched the ground and we walked across the earth, I suddenly felt the grief beginning to lift, and it really it totally shocked me. I wasn't expecting that, but, I, the, but the grief felt lighter, and I felt a connection as if there's been a horrible fire, but this part of the planet is still alive. It's still here. There's still life. And I don't know if that's what you mean when you're describing this healing power, but it was something profound for me that I wasn't expecting at all when we went to that place and saw that destruction. Well, we had it very close to us here in Sonoma County as well the year before, so there's been a a great uh, great number of opportunities to acknowledge what happens when fire rages so uncontrollably. And yes, uh, the collective trauma that was in the air here in Sonoma County and now up in northern and southern California, when we were able to step into it as a community, it generated a tremendous amount of shared uh, feelings. Uh, it really brought us into a deeper sense of community to the, what I call the commons of the soul. It was a collective experience. It wasn't my experience. It wasn't your experience. It was ours. That's part of the beauty of grief work 
is that you begin to see that this is not mine personally. It kind of liberates us from the privatized experience of suffering. That grief is the commons. It is what we all share. You will never meet a human being that does not know suffering. That's just part of what we know. And when these fires came, we lost close to 7,000 homes here in Sonoma County. And we held multiple gatherings around that just to acknowledge and to hold what is almost uncontainable. But when we do it, in, as a, like I say, in a communal setting, we begin to feel something else knitting underneath us, some place to land, something that's holding us that's bigger than our own personal strength. We become held by soul, by culture, by by the dream that's happening, you know, out of the earth. Mm. That's so beautiful that not only are, are we connected right now in this moment with everyone else on the planet who's experiencing grief as well, but every person who has ever existed through time, like, that has been, that's been the legacy that we carry with us. I guess it's our humanity and what makes us human. Right. Yes. I have often thought that as we work on some of the polarities in our society and the divisions between us, that grief would be the one topic that should bring us all together because we share that common heart over our losses and our suffering. And it seems to me if we put every other issue aside and if we could just come together with our neighbors face to face and just talk about grief, we would find we have so much in common and that there's so much that connects us. I think that's beautifully said too. I mean, that's precisely what I'm hoping. And that's why, I mean, what's weird when I begin our weekends on, for our grief rituals, people come from all over the country and they come from other countries as well. We had, people from Australia there last time and England and Canada and and I thank them for their tenacity, you know, for their willingness to travel thousands and thousands of miles just for the privilege of being able to grieve together. But I also say that this is symptomatic of the trouble we're in, that this is not happening in every community, that we have forgotten what it is that humans need in order to really occupy the fullest breadth of, of who we are. And we need regular visitations to the grief shrine, whether that means, as you said, just inviting some neighbors over, that tonight the topic is loss. Tonight we're going to gather and begin to share as best we can as we build this muscle, our capacity to tell each other the grief that we carry. See, grief is not a problem to be solved. It is something that's awaiting witnessing something that's waiting for an adequate containment field so that it can be heard, seen, and basically set down. We're not meant to carry grief around for our entire lifetime in a U-Haul. We're supposed to be able to regularly set this down because it's not meant, you know, in many indigenous cultures, grief is considered a toxin. And science is finally catching up to this intuition. When they began researching grief tears, they're the only ones that take toxins out of the body. No other tear does that. Grief, you know, happy tears, uh, onion tears. Uh, the only tears that take toxins out of the body are grief tears. We have a cleansing cry when we let our grief move. But we need permission, and that's all we're waiting for on some level is some, some form of permission that says, tonight, this is what we're going to do. As long as we can agree that we're not going to try to fix each other, offer advice, all we're going to do is make space for these deep stories that we're all carrying to be heard, to be felt. And maybe we'll make some gesture, like putting a stone into a bowl of water. Some simple movement that acknowledges that the grief has been spoken, heard, and put in the collective the common pool of sorrow our communal cup of sorrow. Oh, I love that. And I know another thing you wrote that really uh, made an impression on me was that we need to to establish a relationship with grief. And that makes so much sense to me that if we have started this relationship with grief at a young age, 
we will be so much more literate in grief throughout life. And as we get older and grief begins to accumulate, we mean we have more and more and more experiences with grief, we will be able to manage those experiences better. But do you feel that that we should be, I mean, what can we be doing say, to help our children develop this relationship with grief so that we, we can help them at a younger age um, begin to acknowledge grief? Well, one thing is to not hide our own from them. You know, um, when we hear, I mean, part of our problem right now is that we are inundated with trauma. I mean, every single day we hear something from around the planet that traumatizes us. And we're not wired for that kind of, constant information about trauma. So one thing we can do for our children is to acknowledge our own overwhelm at times, our own, our own confusion, our own profound sorrow and sadness. But what they can also witness in that statement is that I also have resource. I have friendship. I have ways of expressing this through writing, through dancing, through poetry, through you know, uh, my paintings. I'm not, I'm not powerless in the face of grief. You know, one of the worst things we've learned about grief, well, God, there's lots of <laughs> One of the worst ones is, is that we're supposed to somehow just simply endure it, to get through it, particularly if there's been an acute loss. Well, grief doesn't want to be endured. It wants to be engaged. This is not a passive process. It's actually a very active engagement. So when you mention that idea of the relationship with grief, that's what I'm talking about. The idea is that grief will have its acute times, its, its moments of really intense uh, appearance, but it's always there. It's always there. In those five gates I mentioned, uh, you don't have to look far to find a second or third gate of grief or a fourth or fifth gate of grief showing up at your door. It's there all the time. So our work is to develop a relationship with grief, and if our children saw that, they wouldn't be frightened of it when it shows up at their door, which is what we've inherited as adults. We are the inheritors of a grief-phobic culture. Our parents did not acknowledge grief, typically. And so we, when, when grief shows up, what I notice in my practice and oftentimes on the weekends is that you don't have just a grief moment, you have a grief panic moment or a grief fear moment. They're coupled now. And what I want to do is teach people how to be with grief, to trust grief, so that we can begin to separate out the trauma, the terror, the fear, the pain. So all you're feeling now is just the purity of the heart experiencing you know, and being penetrated by some form of, of sorrow, which is, again, inevitable. They will come. Hmm, that's that's such an interesting thought that perhaps our pure, pure grief has, in some ways, been contaminated by other emotions that make the sorrow intolerable. It, you know, it's been it's now attached with anxiety, as you mentioned, and fear and negativity. When um, the pure grief itself. Uh, may be easier to tolerate than all the, the additional emotions that we feel about having the grief. Right. I think you, you read in my book, I talked about that gr frequently grief does not have a bottom. Mm -hmm. It feels bottomless. So that's part of the experience when, when grief isn't held culturally or in our families or in our communities. We don't trust it. So whenever we get near it, it feels like it's, it's bottomless, like we're going to be in free fall. And people will say to me, if I go in that room, I'm never coming back. I'm just going to disappear. I'm going to drown. And I say to them, if you don't go there, you're not coming back. Mm -hmm. And part of our life force, part of our own vitality gets locked up in the, in the protection and in the defense against sorrow. We don't trust it. So part of it, as I speak about in the book, around taking up an apprenticeship, we have to learn how to walk with grief long term. Like any apprenticeship, it takes a long time to become skillful. Grief, as I speak about, 
frequently is not just an emotion, it's also a faculty of being human. It is a core capacity. But we are very undeveloped in that capacity in this culture. So consequently, we don't know how to grieve. We don't know how to stay close to sorrow, which also then compromises our relationship to joy, mm-hmm. to aliveness. You know, those two are intimately connected. I like the story I tell in the book about this woman I spoke to in Africa. When I came up to her and I just said to her, you have so much joy. Because she did. She was just ebullient, just delightful in her presentation of self. And her response was, that's because I cry a lot. Hmm. I mean, it was shocking. It's so un-American. <laughs> it was so, it wasn't because I'm busy, you know, I keep myself busy or I bought a new car or I shop a lot. No, it's because she had this deep and abiding faithfulness to her sorrow. And consequently, her joy was free to be expressed. That is so important for us to begin to comprehend. Mm. That's that's such a beautiful story. And I love what you're saying about the apprenticeship to grief and realizing in our society some people are not stepping up to that apprenticeship until till their very elder years they they have waited till they're nearing the end of their own lives before they've even begun to address their own grief so they've left themselves a short time short time to learn everything that could that could be learned about about their own grief yeah and it's really hard to do a crash course in grieving um i mean of course there's no option you either have to learn how to do it or you have to shut down which to lead this world, in a sense, as Goethe would say, a troubled guest on the dark earth, is a really tragic ending to a life. So mm-hmm. to be a full participant means we have to open up to all of what life brings us. The soul came here for full participation. It did not come here just for the, you know, the positive events. It came here for everything, because everything to the soul is grist. It is part of what it uses to shape character, to bring depth into our life. So when we avoid sorrow, grief, pain, suffering, we're in a sense living in our lives in the shallow end of the pool. We are not deepening our character so that when we come to the end, we will have felt like we were not just a visitor, but that we had really truly been in the flesh, been in the bone been on this earth, that we walked here, that we felt our lives here abundantly, creatively, intimately, vulnerably. Isn't that why we're here? We're not here just to visit. We're not here just to uh, survive. We're not here just to get by without getting hurt. That's a waste. Mm -hmm. The true invitation is for full participation. I love that. And I wanted to say, Francis, I think that you, you alluded to the five gates of grief that you write about in your book. And I ha- I've never read anything like that before. And that's one of the things I really appreciated in your book is that you were able to talk about all of our grief and all of the ways in which we experience grief over losses. And I think it's so important because if we only envision grief as occurring when someone we love dies, we're missing the significance of these other experiences and events of our lives that add to that that whole the whole burden, I guess, of sorrow that we're carrying. And so I think, let's see, the one, um, I just loved the, the term, the places that have not known love, the second oh. gate. Oh, that, that really touched me. And I I could see it and feel it instantly within myself. I know what those places are. And I know that about many other people that I know. I know what their places are that they hide that right. have not known love. And that's, that's just a, just such a beautiful thought. Beautiful, painful thought. You know, mm-hmm. it's, it's one of, that's the core work that happens in therapies. We have an opportunity to invite the outcast sisters, the outcast brothers to come out from hiding and to be invited back to the fire, to come into some place of warmth. The problem with a lot of our relationship to these outcasts is that we are now holding them with contempt. We judge them. We keep them at a distance. We don't feel that they're worthy of belonging because that's what we were taught. 
your your sadness or your weakness or your you know your vulnerability or your tenderness or your sensitivity or your sexuality. You know, we were, we are told what parts are welcome and what parts aren't, and when we push them away and we banish them to the wasteland, they, they, every one of those experiences of, of departure is a loss to our integrity. And every loss should be honored with grief, but we cannot grieve for what we hold with judgment. That's the predicament. So what therapy is, what, what healing is, what grief work in community is, is about beginning to repair the intimacy with these parts of ourselves, to befriend them, to invite them back in. But I often say they don't come back in oftentimes, you know, gleefully or trusting. They come back in quite wary and suspicious. Do we really mean it? So we have to do what I call a Jane Goodall. You know, Jane did not walk out into the jungle and sit on the floor and say, it's me, it's Jane. You know, it took a long time for the chimps to come out of hiding, to begin to circulate around her, to come close by to her, to touch her, to sit on her lap. That's how it is with these outcast parts of ourselves. We have to be very patient. James Hillman, one of my main teachers, said, in your patience is your soul. What are you willing to be patient with? What are you willing to attend to day after day after day until some small movement occurs and something begins to feel like it's returning? So these are slow soul retrievals. They're slow invitations to recover our, our implicit wholeness that was shattered typically by churches and by schools and by families and by, you know, all the different systems that tell us how we're supposed to be. And Francis, I don't know if, <clears throat> if you see this uh, regularly, but for me in my life, it seems that it has been the death of loved ones, particularly um, each one of my parents, that has really opened the door to me to look at those places within me that have not known love. It was grieving over the death um, and already being in the midst of grief, but that also broke open the parts of myself that I have that I have held in contempt and and allowed me to begin to heal those parts as well. So for me, that was a blessing that I found um, during the times when, when I was experiencing the the death of my loved one. So I don't know if that's something that you you observe as well. Yeah, it's very common that when there's a, a major fissure in our strategic life, say the death of a parent or a end of a marriage or something, that all of what lies below the fault line tries to find a way up through the crack. All of the untended sorrows tend to try to make their way and join in, you know, in the in the wholehearted expression of sorrow. So yeah, that's a very frequent. I've heard that story many times, um, thinking of a woman whose daughter was diagnosed, and within four weeks she died. It was just this rapid decline in, in death. and death. She was just, as you can imagine, just heart sick, just heartbroken. And she said in the middle of all of that grieving, she began to notice all the ways that she had deprived herself of taking care of herself. All of the self-neglect, the self-abandonment, the self-betrayal, all began to kind of crack in there. She had no idea that, that the death of her daughter was going to lead to the recovery of her own self-care, but it did. There was a strange grace that came through that death, but she began to recover part of her own soul. Mm. And it so points out how intertwined all of these griefs are that we that we carry throughout our lifetime. Yeah, that's why I say, you know, no matter which door or which gate you enter, they all lead to the same hall. We they all come into the same communal chamber of our of our shared losses. You can come in through the sorrows of the earth or through the death of someone close or through that second gate we're just talking about. It doesn't matter. There's no comparison and no need to compare. Each aspect of sorrow is its own valid expression of sorrow and requires its own full measure of time and patience and work and attention so that it can become what it wants to become. And gate number
number four, Francis, also was something unique that I hadn't, I hadn't really read about in any other books talking about grief, what we expected and did not receive. And um, that gave me as well an opportunity to look back on all the times when I felt disappointed or felt I was a failure or felt my own life let me down because something didn't work out that I had that I had so hoped for. And um, once again, that was really a, a lovely opportunity to expand my awareness of, of all the different types of grief in my life. So if you would want to talk more about that, about gate number four. Sure. That one slowly emerged over many, many gatherings of, the, of people for the grieving together. And what I began to slowly see and understand was that uh, as human beings, we're wired to expect what our deep time ancestors experienced, which was to be in circles like this, to grieve together, to celebrate together, to dance together, to laugh together, to eat meals together, to gather firewood, sit under the stars and tell the old stories expected to comfort each other in times of sorrow. We, we had this whole embedded expectation latent in us, and almost none of that occurred. So there's this profound emptiness where something of that magnitude should have been expressed in our lifetime. And in the absence, we begin to blame ourselves. We begin to feel like somehow I must have failed. I must have done something wrong because the intuition tells us that that should have been filled by something. There should have been some response to who I am in the world. So all of those expectations, all of those things that you know, are wired and coded inside of us, when they don't take shape, when they don't materialize, we begin to really feel like the, there must be something wrong with me. So we're doubly condemned. Not only is the experience missing, but there's also a tendency for self-blame. What did I do that this did not materialize? Does that make sense? Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. Very much. Yeah, this is what now <clears throat> evolutionary psychology is talking a lot about, is that you know we were shaped over hundreds of thousands of years in a certain way, which was very relational, very intimate, not only to the human community, but also to the more than human community, to watersheds and, and seasons and moon cycles and you know, stars and, you know, all of that was part of our relationships. And when those begin to gradually erode and disappear to now where we live primarily inside buildings, where we visit nature, but we live inside of a concrete, steel, glass, um, you know, temperature-controlled environments that do not show us the stars, we stare at a TV screen or a computer screen, Mm -hmm. There's something that is not being articulated that we expected, and that is a profound grief that we don't even know how to articulate. Mm -hmm. So as I began to understand that, and as I expressed that in communities around the country, there's this sense of, oh, my God, that is so true. I have felt this profound emptiness inside of me that I've ascribed to somehow something I didn't do right. But what if the emptiness is an absence? or well, what we expected did not materialize. That's worth grieving over. And in the very process of grieving over, we begin to actualize the thing that we missed in the first place. So when we are in grief ritual circles, we talk about being in sudden village. And while we're there, we're actually inside the things that we expected and did not receive. We are sharing dreams together. We are sharing meals together. We are singing together. We are weeping together, we're laughing together, we're taking walks together. We're doing the things that we expected. And in those moments, there's no part of us that's wondering what's on sale at Kmart. No part of us that's wanting to buy the next bigger car, the next bigger TV. That part of us is feeling that we are inside of the primary satisfactions that nourish the soul fully. Mm. And you wrote um, in that same section uh, the question, 
what is the gift you carry in your soul to act, to ask a person instead of what do you do or how do you make a living what is the gift that you carry in your soul ah oh, that's so that's just mind blowing to me and um how that completely turns around our notions of what success means or accomplishment means well, thank you for picking up that piece because that's, that's so crucial we teach kids from you know kindergarten on how to get a good career. And that's that's fine. Nothing wrong with that. But we're never asking them, you know, what did you bring with you? What what has accompanied you? When I was leading men's initiation for seventeen years, which is a, a year long process that we put men through to kind of ripen them into people who can show up for the community, one of the core things we did is watch how they interacted with the other men in the process. And out of that, we began to decipher, kind of discern the quality of their gift. Now, it's not something you're going to make money from. You can't earn a living from it, but you can earn a life from that. You can live from that. You can feel like you are necessary. Part of our depression in this culture is feeling unneeded. Mm. We don't feel as if we're cosmically significant. Like, what I'm, I could, you know, I can work at a bank or work in a corporation or do something, but but what did I come here for? What is the calling in my soul? And when we don't feed that, when we don't explore that, there is a deep grief that comes with feeling as if I missed my call. I missed the reason why I came here. I didn't come here just to earn a living, which I find it to be an exceedingly obscene phrase, as if you have to earn a living. Hmm. Oh, so true, so true. I never thought of it that way. But Well, I have an issue that I want to talk to you about to get your opinion. As a doctor, one of one of the problems I observe in my profession is that, and when we've all observed this, doctors are not doing a good job of talking to their patients about end-of-life issues and addressing death, dying, and grief. They're more likely to medicate grief than to have a conversation with someone about it. But what I believe is that doctors themselves are suffering from a huge load of unacknowledged and unexpressed grief because of of the work that we do and because of, uh, you know, the patients that we're caring for in the hospital on a busy day when we have 10 other people waiting for us, we don't have time to stop and think about the child that we saw die in the emergency room who was mm-hmm. part of an auto accident. There's no time. And it's not just doctors. It's everyone else who works in that setting. And so to me, it feels as if healthcare personnel are walking around with an enormous, enormous load of grief. And a lot of it isn't, it's not so, it's not like the, the personal grief of losing your own loved one, but it's, it has to be over and over a sense of failure in your work because you couldn't save the life of someone or a sense of traumatization because of witnessing a person, a young person die that we desperately wanted to save. And I'm just, I'm just curious to know if you've worked with healthcare personnel and if you if you see it that way as well. Well, you know, I have very little to add to that because you said it so so well. And we have a lot of people from nurses, hospice workers, uh, therapists, uh, social workers, doctors. Um, the healthcare professions have not taught them at all how to tend to the fact that you will be around tremendous amounts of suffering. I mean, you're doing noble work, but at the same time, how do you tend to the fact that you will inevitably pick up tremendous amounts of grief in your body? And if you do not process that, what happens over time is the heart grows thick and dense. And that's when you lose your capacity to really feel into the moment and you become more mechanical and more, um, oh, what's the word, strategic. You, mm-hmm. you diagnose, you dispense, you treat, but you don't enter into the moment that is so poignantly vulnerable between you and that other human being which is a great tragedy to, to both of you. 
to the patient in need and to the human being inside the doctor. The doctor becomes a persona that protects you from the vulnerable moment. So, yeah, I see this frequently. We do have a lot of healthcare professionals. I'm actually going to be doing a, um, a retreat for firefighters, women firefighters, uh, in the coming months because of how much grief they carry in their bodies and they're working in this very, you know, uh, manly field where they're supposed to tough it out and muscle it out and not show. But they are also experiencing tremendous grief from the bodies they cannot pull out of the fire, from the you know, number of deaths that they encounter, from the suicides within their ranks, from the cancer rates that are you know, off the charts in that community. So, you know, yes, it's everywhere. Mm-hmm. But the, the prohibition against honoring it and acknowledging it is killing us, killing the doctors, it's killing you know, the firefighters, it's killing the nurses. It's, we need to be able to somehow courageously break the taboo and speak the truth about what's happening. I did an in-service uh, for doctors in at San Francisco, um, University of San Francisco, a couple of years ago, and just to see and to hear their stories was just heartbreaking. You know how much they have to go. There. And you were using the idea of this one doctor saying he had to go from a one child's room where basically the child was dying to the next child's room where the the next child was dying. And, I, I, don't, I, almost, I almost lost it. I, I don't know what to do with that. Well, of course, you know what to do with it, which is to get on your knees and weep. But you can't do that in the middle of the hospital. You have to be in control. You have to show that this is not getting to you. But at what cost, right? What cost? Mm-hmm. So I really, I'm really glad you brought up that, that question. Well, I have often wondered... Are, are there, I've wondered about rituals that we could do that could be helpful in the moment um, for doctors and nurses. And I don't know if you've heard of the pause, the medical pause um, that was started by, by an RN a few years ago in a hospital where after a patient died that they had been trying to resuscitate and they were unsuccessful in the resuscitation, he just spontaneously asked everyone, could we just pause for a moment? Um, Because this person was alive and now is, is no longer alive. And could we pause to honor this life? Could we pause to honor all of the people who love him? And could we honor ourselves for the work we just did in in trying to maintain his life and the pause now has it spread to hospitals all over the country and I was really excited about it because it's simply it's like a one minute ritual basically Um, but it seems to be having an effect and um, I, I just feel like that's exactly what we need we have to find ways of incorporating these rituals back into our work whatever it is yeah, I mean, if we were a sane culture, there might be a, a grief ritual once or twice, you know, once a month or every other month that you could go to, you know, as a as a collective of doctors and nurses and healthcare people, and just to keep emptying what has been gathered. You you know, you cannot keep saturating the heart with that much sorrow, and not ex- not expect it to affect you, in one way or the other. You know, un- unexpressed sorrow over time leads to bitterness, which is one of its worst developmental outcomes. So we don't want people to become hardened and bitter over time. We want them to be able to stay flexible, supple, open, yielding, responsive, alive, generous, bountiful. That comes from a heart that's not encumbered by too much grief. And I see what you mean if we were to schedule regular, like say monthly monthly yeah. gatherings where grief would be addressed, and whether it took place in our churches or in the yeah. hospital or a hospice or in our homes, wherever, if we attended to it on a regular basis, uh, we, w- we would be so much healthier in the long run. It's kind of like 
flossing your teeth or something. You can't just do it every now and then. It needs to be. That's regular. true. I mean, I talk about grief as soul maintenance. We're, we're much better at taking care of our cars than we are taking care of our souls. We don't miss our oil change, but we do miss our soul obligations to tend to it, to give it an opportunity to grieve together. So, yeah, even if it feels incredibly awkward and clumsy those first few times of doing it, it's worth trying. It's worth gathering and saying, I'm going to host this. Anybody want to come? You might not have anybody coming for a while. Or you might have one or two people. But hopefully, with enough repetition, there is a gradual and growing willingness for people to begin to acknowledge, I too have been really weighed down by the sorrows from this month of patient care. So yes, by all means, experiment. I, I, I gave a few options of rituals in the back of the book that you can do very simply. And hopefully, you know, some other doctors will be interested. Yeah, I really resonated um, with one you mentioned about stones and placing stones into water. If you Would you mind describing that a little bit better? No, again, it's a very simple ritual. You set up a shrine in the middle of the room um, with a little tiny table in the middle with a cloth over that and a bowl of water on top of that, a fairly large bowl of water. And then you know, several dozen stones, small oh half dollar sized stones underneath that. And the group circles around that and you know, whenever someone's ready they can go to the middle of the room and pick up a stone and speak their sorrow into that stone, either quietly or aloud. And then they place that stone in the in the bowl of water. And over time as people go back and forth to that little shrine and put stones in the water, you begin to feel and this is what happened. One of the beautiful rituals we did after the fires here last October, a year ago October, was we had bowls all around the room. There's several hundred people at this talk that, that I gave, interview that I was giving. And we brought lots and lots of stones. And uh, people would then get up and speak their sorrow into the stone and put it in a bowl of water. And the stones began to gather more and more stones in each bowl. And there was that realization, as I said earlier this hour, that, huh, I'm not alone with this. This is not my sorrow. This is ours. This is our collective communal grief. We're all feeling this. So when we can do that, there's a great deal of relief and healing that comes out of that sense of collectivity, of common, commonality that we're sharing in this. When grief is so sequestered as it is in this culture, we feel abnormal for feeling sorrow. We feel that there's something wrong with us because we are a be happy culture. Our obsession with happiness in this culture is kind of a uh, oh, camouflage for something much more subtle and much more uh, hidden, which is our grief. We don't want to invite that into the picture. So we have to be happy constantly. Mm. I love the just the vision in my mind. I was picturing the bowl with water filled with stones. And then what what do you do with the bowl at the end of that at okay. the end of that meeting? Good, thank you. Um, usually there's a procession outdoors and we take our sorrows and our tears and the water and we give it to the green world and we know that the earth can metabolize and digest and make good use of the compost of our sorrow and things will grow from that things will be green from that and then typically what we do is that the stones have typically been gathered in a sacred way someone will go down to the ocean or to the river pick up these stones with prayers, and we tell the people, once we're done, these stones will be taken back to where we gathered them, and they'll be washed by the salt water of the, earth, of the, of the ocean. They'll be scoured again. 
and your tears will become crab thought and you know salmon dream and part of the ongoing movement of life. Oh, I love, I just love how it comes full circle that the stones are gathered from the riverbed or from the ocean and then returned there again I, after the ceremony. And that it, it uh, completes for us, it, it shows us that process of always being able to recycle the sorrow in a way. I mean, that it can be returned to the earth and um, that it, it has the power to nourish. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Our grief, in many indigenous cultures, our grief is food for the ancestors. Mm. It's a way that they're nourished by our acknowledging our own sorrows. And when we stop that, in a sense, we break a covenant with that other world, with that invisible world of the ancestors. So it's another part of the reparation. It's another part of the ecology of the sacred, is that we continue to fulfill and of this old covenant, this old contract between between worlds. Oh, that's just so lovely. Um, and, and you mentioned also in the book coupling grief and gratitude, and I liked that idea as well, so that we don't have this sense. I mean, when we are willing to carry our grief and to acknowledge it, that that we don't have a sense of being weighed down and buried in sorrow all the time, that there's room as well for gratitude. Well, that is the mark of a mature human being, is to carry grief in one hand and gratitude in the other, and to be stretched large by these two potent presences in our life. In some ways, grief and gratitude are sisters. They're deeply connected to one another. We grieve because of what we loved, and we're grateful for that love that was in our life. And so that's part of the relationship between these two things. So if we only pick up gratitude and we ignore grief, we develop but kind of superficially. We don't develop a depth for our character. But if we only pick up grief and ignore gratitude, we can become bitter, like I said, and become pretty cynical about life. But together, grief and gratitude form a prayer of life. We're constantly acknowledging loss, and at every moment, even in the midst of loss, we are being blessed by the sky, by the moon, by friendship, by air, you know, by gravity, by color, by the sweet sound of rain, beauty of falling snow. Every moment is a blessing. So, no, I am not an advocate for getting caught in grief. I'm an advocate for honoring grief so that I can acknowledge all of the beauty that's around me. Everything that's blessing me, moment by moment, even in the midst of sorrow, there is something falling on me, unexpected, undeserved, simply a gift. Mm -hmm. I think I tell the story in the book about the woman I was sitting with who was grieving, this is some years ago, over the Iraq war, and she was just so broken about all the suffering she was witnessing to the children, to the land, with the depleted uranium and the number of deaths and just the destruction. And I let her just cry for 15, 20 minutes. I just sat there with her. And at one point I leaned down to her and I asked her, did you happen to notice the plum blossoms today? And she said, no. And I said, did you happen to notice that the mustard was in bloom? And she said, no. And I said, well, we can't possibly tolerate or endure the horrors of Iraq without plum blossoms and mustard blooms. Hmm. The grief and the gratitude are, they have to be wedded in some delicate way so that our heart is open to the sorrow, but it's also being simultaneously bathed by gratitude in the beauties that surround us. And coming back to the fires again, I remember reading some of the survivors of the fire who said, I feel more gratitude for my life than I ever have. Um, I, I'm grateful for everything. Having lost everything, I'm grateful for life itself. And I've never felt this depth of gratitude before. So it makes so much sense that in some way our sorrow can increase our capacity for gratitude and show us what what true gratitude really is. Right. 
Absolutely true. Absolutely true. And Frances, uh, Esther typed in a question. She asked, can you speak a little about humor as a respite for grief? Well, it's, it's a great question, Esther. Um, I would say it's a companion of grief. You know, when we're deep in the ritual process, um, people are up, up at the shrine wailing side by side. It's an amazing vision to see people crying side by side. But at some point, there is this infectious joy and laughter that begins to penetrate the room. It's as if, not so much a respite, but a consequence of being faithful to your grief. That when we're really able to express it fully, we enter into another relationship that brings wholeheartedness, fullheartedness, laughter, joy, delight. It's almost inexplicably uh, self-evident when it come, when we get to that point in the in the process. It comes in the room. So. Definitely lots of laughter, lots of play, lots of um, joyful, unencumbered, unselfconscious expression that comes out when we're not trying to hide our sorrow. Mm. And so, and it comes spontaneously. You're not reading out of a book of jokes to try to make people laugh. It's the laughter that arises spontaneously when you've gone that deep into your own pain. Right. Um, well, Esther wrote, um, plum blossoms and mustard blooms, so beautiful. That's why I love gardening as a respite for grief, too. And she, she went on to say, thank you for the depth of wisdom and openness to be vulnerable, Francis. Great interview. I hope to meet you in person at a workshop one day. Thank and, you, Esther. Yeah. Uh, so I see that our time is coming to an end. It's gone so quickly. I can't believe it's almost been an hour already. Mm -hmm. Francis, you're writing another book right now. Is that correct? Yes, I'm definitely working on it. <laughs> Will that be about grief as well, or are you? No, it's on? more about um, living a soulful life and why it matters. Mm. There will be a chapter on grief in there, but it's um, what... Uh, most of our focus of late has been on the self, on the individual me. But there's a deeper reality, a deeper truth to our identity, to our character, that in many traditions that's called soul. And so I want to develop that idea quite thoroughly. I did a lecture series last year called Living a Soulful Life and Why It Matters. Ten weeks, and we covered a different topic, imagination, beauty, um, grief, uh, darkness and duende, um, community, love, um, wounds and suffering, um, all kinds of delicious, juicy topics. And how does the soul hold those? More than how does the individual self hold, the, hold those? I hope that makes sense, but that's mm -hmm. kind of where I'm heading with that. Oh, that sounds wonderful. I, I will be sure to read that. Um, Francis, your your writing is beautiful. I, I could just like linger with each sentence and mm. <laughs> read it over and over. Just beautiful words, beautiful imagery, um, in addition to just profound content. And um, for me personally, I will say that uh, you, you really um, stirred something in me and uh, I, I just, I felt deeply moved from everything that I read. So I want to thank you for writing everything and keep writing because we'll we do that. <laughs> need your wisdom and we need your books. And then thank you so much for this past hour and just being willing to sit here and talk with me. I've enjoyed it so much. Well, I've enjoyed it too. Thank you for having me. Yes, it's been a true pleasure and I'm sure everyone listening um, feels the same way. Um, you, so, you, asked, you asked wonderful questions. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate your, your skill at that. So, Francis, be well, and good luck with your writing. Thank you so much. Enjoy the snow. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. All, right. All right. Take care. Goodbye.
I hope you enjoyed my interview with Francis Weller about his book, The Wild Edge of Sorrow. And I will have a link on the show notes if you're interested in purchasing that book or in learning more about Francis's work at his website. But I just wanted to share, I really appreciate his thoughts about the collective nature of grief. I've talked about that a lot myself, um, but he says it so beautifully, the idea that we all need to come together and carry our grief together and heal it together. And also the healing power of nature and being out in nature as a way of addressing our grief and finding healing for it. And the intimate connection between grief and joy. I've also talked about that myself and experienced that in my own life. And um, I appreciated too the ritual he shared with us of placing stones in water. I think that could be a really powerful ritual to use as a group function together. And um, also the idea of perhaps holding monthly grief sessions or grief groups or even grief rituals in hospitals for hospital personnel as a way for people to come together and express their grief. And even if only a few people showed up each time, it could be a very powerful healing experience. And so I wanted to put that idea out there in if any of you happen to work in hospitals, or maybe if you are a hospice and you have an outreach team trying to figure out what could we do in our community to get hospice better known. How could we reach out to physicians and hospital staffs in our area? What if you offered, we'll come once a month and we will host a, a little grief ritual. And it, it only needs to be like 15 or 20 minutes long, something very simple. But we will have a little grief ceremony at on a certain day of the month, every month, and any of your staff can attend. We'll do it within your hospital. Maybe if the hospital has a chapel or whatever, you could ask your chaplain to go help lead this grief session. And it could be for hospital staff and also patients and family members as well to attend. That's just an idea I've had as a way to remember that dealing with grief belongs within our healthcare system. It's something very important that we, that we remember to address and encourage people to address as we're dealing with healthcare issues. So that's just a thought I had after uh, re-listening to my interview with Francis Weller. So thanks so much for tuning in today and also for tuning in every time you join me here and listen to what I have to share on the podcast. I really appreciate knowing that you're out there listening and also enjoying this content. So please feel free to share this information with other people. Let them know about the podcast. Also, just share whatever you happen to be learning on the podcast, because that's really the goal for this podcast is to spread information and education about end of life issues. And if you enjoy this podcast, consider going on iTunes or Stitcher Radio or Spotify, wherever you happen to be listening and leave a review because the, the more reviews we get, the more likely this podcast is to show up in searches for other people who are looking for content like this. So thanks again to all of you. And as we begin this holiday season, I hope that uh, your days are rich and meaningful and full of blessings for you and your loved ones. So until next week, remember, we're here for love. So face your fear be ready for anything and everything that life brings your way and love each and every moment. Bye-bye.